Hi, I'm Joni Cooper, Director of Programming for the Docklands Documentary Film Festival here at CFI. And I'm absolutely delighted to have two of the artists of the bookmakers here today and forever. We're in cyberspace. The director of the film, James Kennard, and one of the passionate and dedicated book artists, uh, Mark Sargianis. James, I just have to say that the film is just pure magic. <laughs> I didn't want it to end. I wish you had made a feature length film with all this beauty and joy. Oh yeah, there's, there's more material, but this is the <laughs> film that made sense by the end, you know, that we wanted to, to tell, yeah. Thank you, that's very kind. It, 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 you might have to go to a series soon. Um, it's been talked about. Aha, uh -huh, great. Books just, they provide so much joy and that joy was so evident throughout your film. And oh boy, oh boy, do we ever need it right now. So it's a film for the times. And the music was so perfectly chosen throughout. Uh, and I just have to um, ask yeah. before I forget, was that real thunder when you introduced Peter Koch's lead, lead book? No. Oh. Um, there was thunder that day. It was a storm. But I was like, eh, it's like lead books. It's, he's, you know, being a little creepy and, like, you know, arch about it all. I'm like, eh, just, let's pop it up. <laughs> but I have, I have a bit of that philosophy with documentaries. It's like, yeah, it's not actually reality. You're allowed to stretch it if it makes sense of the story, you know. It's I mean, I, like, I joke about them, um, Mark, your uh, workshop, which we filmed in, we have like four scenes in it. The lighting is different every time. Oh yeah. <laughs> it, none of it is the real lighting. It's like, well, what's the mood right now? Um, and that's, you know, that's fine. Because <laughs> you, you, you need to tell a story about real things, but it's a, it's a story. Yeah. Well, I, I, it was perfect that, in fact, every sequence, every, every, every scene, I just felt like you, just took the best lighting that you could in the circumstance and it just came out right. I mean, I, I think, is this your first film as director? It's my first feature. I've directed a lot of shorter stuff, but yeah, oh. the first time people allowed me to have that much budget. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because, and you've got uh, quite a, a career made from uh, a camera operator, is that right? Uh, kind of in everything. Um, so I've edited this is the fourth feature I've edited uh, and shot on all of those and also was uh, directing some of it. And, and uh, yeah, it's a small team, so you kind of end up wearing all hats. Well, it, I did not notice the difference, difference in lighting in the different scenes at, in Mark's um, warehouse office there. So it was yeah. totally well done. I, I somehow had you know, originally when planning the festival, I somehow envisioned a kind of an analog evening with around around books and things. And it's so weird that now here we are talking in virtual space about something so analog. Not all analog, as 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 it shows, but um, totally analog. Yeah. And yeah, well, what Mark does is pretty damn analog. So uh, I guess you do see that you've got a laptop hooked up to the, uh, the um, what's it, to the press. The cast, yeah, to the casting machine. <laughs> to the casting machine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, don't so. mind, I don't mind technology too much, as long as it makes it easier to use that big machine. It's the means to an end for sure. Yeah. Did you, now, Mark, you have since moved from the Bay Area to the East Coast, is that right? I have in January of this year. We uh, just not had anything to do with anything that happened this year, but we had just been planning to move closer to family and get, get a little more space and get a little piece of property that could bring all the casting and printing machines to, because it was always very hairy in the studio that I was at. I mean, they never, somehow I never got managed to get kicked out, but I should have over the years. And I was just <laughs> lucky that I was able to get out before that happened. And because otherwise it would have cost a lot more to do all of it. But we, yeah, we, we came out to Southern Maryland and I just got kind of done building back the shop and starting starting to, to make new books actually this past month. So it took a little while, but it feels good. So did you actually move all of your equipment and gear? Uh, yeah, I, I got six 16 foot containers that I loaded myself in Oakland and then drove across the country with the family and then met them on the other side and unloaded them 
once we got into here. So it was a very miserable 30 days of my life, I'd say. I would never want to repeat it ever again. But it's done. It's so done. They're safe. No more moving. <laughs> never, never again. <laughs> That's a lot. Yeah. Um, you still got the panels behind you, actually, as you see in the film. Um, yeah, the, this, yeah. This is the uh, the mural that was on the front of my studio that I ended up putting inside my new shop, which is a retrofitted three car garage. Um, but I put a ceiling up and started putting up the walls and kind of preserved some of the old artwork and mural stuff. Nice. Really nice. I mean, because it is, it's, it's such an incredible, um, art to do and such dedication. I mean, it, it, it's almost like, like I, I sort of likened it in my head as to, as to working with animation because everything you do is just so time consuming and so precise mm -hmm. to come yeah, up. It's, it's ridiculous. Uh, all the, all the time that gets kind of invested in, in at least the different aspects. In my case, it's like typecasting was always kind of my main focus, but uh, you know, you need, you need to be able to do all the parts, you know, to get a book in the end. So add them all up and it takes it takes a year or two to make any book at least at least it does for me kind of in this in this style beautiful books now um james how how did the idea for the film come about how did these books enter your life so i've had to answer this question a couple times and i realize i remember it a little differently each time so mark and I actually knew each other socially, um, just through our various friends in the Bay Area. Um, but I didn't really have an idea for a book movie. And then actually my dad, who's the, um, he's the senior producer on the film, he's a longtime documentary maker, uh, he visited the Arion Press and was just like, this is very interesting. We should maybe pitch to do a thing. Um, and then, you know, then I got to visit and in 2014, we did um, get money and we made a, a, a short film that's kind of the precursor to this movie um, called Ariane Press Creating the 100th, when Mark was still working there um, as, in your apprenticeship, um, as was Davy and, well, many of our friends, um, I guess, had several in there. And that was a success and that everyone liked it. And so we always talked about this, that there was a lot more um, in this world that would make an interesting story. and. So then in 2015, we started having talks with some people who are our main funders, the main film about doing a, yeah, doing a feature. Um, and then they said yes to fund the initial uh, round of, um, of just even just a pitch video to try to raise some money. And then they just kept liking us enough that they uh, supported us throughout the whole production. So, yeah. Great choice on their part. <laughs> it really is is it's really something, especially to see the end product of, of what these, what, what is produced. Like it just blows me away what, what work they come out with. Yeah, it, it's a cool world. I mean, I, did, I had a moment early on where I'm like, a whole movie about like bookmakers, don't you feel like it'll be like claustrophobic in a studio, just forever watching people like focus <laughs> in on, you know, this very time consuming work. And it was like, no, 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 this world is like super varied. There was a different attack and approach. And, you know, there's loads of people I like met and visited, people in, like Mexico and uh, across the US, you know, and who were like great, but then weren't like the right fit or I just didn't have time for them. Um, so we just kind of picked the ones, or I just kind of picked the ones that I was like, oh, yeah, you'll, you'll be great to work with, it'll be great for the story. And it helps that in the Bay Area, there's such a huge bookmaking world. I don't think a lot of people realize that. Um, that it's it's all there. They love that That's studio why, business. I ended up there, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a whole history of that which doesn't really come up with film so much because San Francisco used to be such a big printing town, so all this equipment was around. And, and once it kind of stopped being, you know, the center for all of that, people sold off all this equipment to artists. So <laughs> they have these amazing printers and things. I mean, Arion was always been a really like fine press kind of thing. They they they've carried on, but. Yeah, there's just stuff around and the knowledge and it's an artistic city, traditionally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it comes through. Um, Mark, did you have you taken any books or any of your any of your art to Codex 
which I didn't even know about Codex until I saw the film. And now I'm just, I can't wait to go. Oh yeah. I have, it's funny. I, I, I'm hopefully fingers crossed. I'll be there in May next year with my own table in previous years. I usually had what I was working on kind of out at uh, Mills College table because for five years uh, while I was making those books, I was working uh, as a studio manager at Mills College and they always had a table for their graduate program. And so I usually worked the table and just kind of was able to have my, just like a work in the corner, just for, you know, people that knew me personally, just as a chance you could swing by, but I didn't sell anything at the, at the fair in those paths, those last two, um, but next year it should be a little, hopefully everything goes smoothly. Yeah, yeah. wasn't it? I, I found it quite cool. It's like, because it's a biennial, biennial, excuse me, biennial event, right? And no event happened in this year of COVID, which mm -hmm. is fortuitous actually. Yeah, no, hopefully it got delayed and that actually hopefully will help me out because going to Cox, you usually should have something new to bring with you and I could use a few extra months to bring something new with me. So I'll take it. Nice. Fabulous, yeah. It was <laughs> kind of dodged a bullet there. <laughs> well, originally, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, when, you know, when you were making Ham on Rye, Mark, uh, like the plan was to be like, oh, it'll be like this huge success story. You like bring it to Codex and sell uh -huh. it. And then it like just took longer. And then Mark yeah. filmed a long time. Um, so there's actually a little piece where I filmed with Mark at, uh, at Codex just being like, well, we didn't quite make it in time, but mm -hmm. you know, like putting out little flyers, let people know it's coming. And then we were just like, and eh, no one needs that. We just have a really nice scene at the end where Mark just, you know, gets to his uh, own release. Yeah, just, they're my own party. That's how it usually goes to get yeah. to throw a big party. And that was great. <laughs> so yeah, yeah that's, how, that's how it shook out. But yeah, people should know about Codex in the Bay Area. It's like, it's awesome to visit. It's open to the public, goes on for days, and it's just a good visit. It's just in Richmond. Well, and you hear that one collector say that most of the pieces he bought were under $50. And so that that's encouraging for me <laughs> <laughs> yeah those are definitely some slighter things because the average price for a book made like the sexy codex isn't quite high but uh yeah. Yeah. it goes for good reason <laughs> exactly yeah how am right mark that was that was a, a full year or just under a year that it took you to complete oh no it was um i'd say it was about two and a half years of production from start to finish. But I mean, and there was previous to that, it was, you know, at least six months just in the planning stages and rights acquisition and stuff. But it was, it was a little over two years of between casting, printing and binding. And even now I still, you know, if I do sell a ham now, I, I still bind it to order. So it'll take me a week to get all the materials and bind the new copy, it takes forever. Yeah, and not to mention the initial work that your, your partner had done on getting all the words Mm -hmm. transcribed, yeah. Yep. Coded and everything. Yeah. It was a lot. That was big. Never done it. We had never done anything like a big novel before, but it's it's significantly more yeah, significantly more difficult to plan than than shorter books. Um yeah, really yeah. Stretch, stretch the shop thin for sure. Even at Codex, you don't really see that. No, yeah. Right. No <laughs> presses making you know, several hundred page books. That's a Arion Press is by far the I mean, they do it every year. You know, they always have. That's it's pretty rare. Um, otherwise, yeah. But I mean, how many people work there? It's like a yeah, whole eight, operation. Yeah, eight full-time production people there. You know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I, I also loved, you know, what a lot of the folks you interviewed said, like a book being a spiritual item. And I, I felt that the film really paid homage to it with its gorgeous cinematography and music and just it just felt like it was pure reverence to the books and books is story that go beyond and books is yeah. objects made with such love and care um i mean yeah i mean well it, it reflects what people were saying in the interviews and how they felt about books um but it was interesting i mean again like i say we ended up in an hour just wonderful because we're going to be on public television and we just ended up right to time um, but there, there was a lot more, um, and that's why I say it could be a series, because there was a whole thing I, I, I scripted and 
even storyboarding quite a bit about like the history of the book. And it was a really great thing to research. Um, you know, my background actually, I, I studied history in college. Um, and uh, it is a really cool story how books have just kind of always transformed into whatever society needs of them at the time. Um, whether it's just cataloging information early on into then like, oh, we should put our stories down and then it, it cha stories change when they get turned into a book and not an oral tradition. Um, and then into like, you know, mass printing and popular books. It's pretty crazy. And, and, and the fact I always love is that books were invented three times uh, in the West, in China and in the Americas um, independently and had their own traditions. So the American one is basically was all burned and wiped out. But it's a story where it's just like, yeah, whatever people need of this thing, it, it shall transform into. And that was kind of the, the sort of, the objective of the film was to say, well, what should books be now? You know, now that we're living in a digital age. It's like, well, let's embrace the physicality or let's do something weird or different or, you know, all these things and let's enjoy your craft. So yeah, that, that was the, uh, why we, <laughs> what we're really trying to get, express, uh, yeah. And they are, you know, they've evolved, like a number of folks in your film said, you know, they have evolved into be the perfect device for humans because yeah. it evolved to, to fit what we, how, how best we can read. But now as time goes on, it's interesting to see how, how the books are evolving and, uh, but I, I do have to say, like, I read books on anything, but I really do prefer a paper book to be like, like, um, Karen, I think it was Karen Blights in, in your in film. London, like, yeah. A sense of control. And I find that's true because I can close it. I can look at the cover. I can page through it without, you know, having to figure out where my device puts me. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm agnostic. I think there's books which I've read from re with paperback that was perfect for when I was just on beaches on a holiday. And then I've read books that were like way better as ebooks because they had like insane footnotes and links and stuff. And, you know, there's a sci fi book called Excel Rando that was like, that was better as an ebook. But, you know, it's whatever fits. But a lot of stuff, it's a long, you know, thoughtful reading is probably often better as a physical book. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the other thing I didn't know, I didn't know anything about the Internet Archive in San Francisco either. And what they're yeah. They're awesome. They're really cool. Uh, it is, um, oh man, it makes me sound like a lazy director, but when I, when I was, I'm now living in Los Angeles, actually, but when I was in San Francisco, I moved a bit over a year ago, uh, the Arion Press was about five blocks from my house, and Internet Archive was about three. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, kind of insane. They used to throw a party every year, like their anniversary party at the Internet Archive, and they just had like a bunch of food and booze, and they just opened the doors, and you could go in and just kind of walk around. And I remember just after work, we always would go to that, that once a year for years, years on end. Yeah, and, and in fact, I mean, still, they, they, well, actually, I'm probably not now, but they do, they were at the time doing, you know, like a free lunch every Friday as well. So I would just go, and they'd just be like, yeah, they just want people to meet each other, you know, it's a buffet. And, yeah, I mean, they, uh, no, I believe in what they do very much. They, I mean, the, the whole point is they're like, you know, a foundation is the thing you can trust to preserve things. Um, you know, like, like Brewster Cable says in the film. Now, I, I, is there still a controversy around internet archives and internet digital libraries and that kind of thing? Like, I just, I don't hmm. understand the issue there. Um, they got in trouble earlier this year. Um, <laughs> But now they're out of trouble. Um, yeah, people are, so they have the, they are using a legal theory that if you have one copy of a book archived, then they can legally lend that out to one person at a time. Uh, they changed that rule um, during like uh, the pandemic because they were like, look, no one can get access to stuff. Most people can't even get to the public library even though there are book pickups. And so they're just like, it's all free right now. Uh, and yeah, a bunch of the publishing houses were very upset. Um, but they've stopped that policy and everyone's made peace. So yeah, there's a little, it's always gonna be writing an edge, but they're basically operating the, on the same understanding as libraries do. You know, once it's published, it should be accessible. And if anything, their big thing that Bruce Drew actually talked about, but isn't really in the film, is orphan works, where no one knows who the copyright 
who has the copyright, so it can never really be republished, even if it's a really important one. In fact, there's a book, I can't remember his name, which he talks about, that's about, it was written in the 60s, it was about all of these problems with like long-term archiving with the copyright law and, and all that. And it itself is an orphan book. So it's almost impossible to find. Um, so yeah, they're, they're, they're forging ahead in terms of like what is the legal framework. I mean, a bit like, you know, Electronic Frontier Foundation and these places. Um, but definitely heart's in the right place, but it's all, it's all new, it's all being figured out. I mean, people worried about Google scanning everything because Google makes this money on advertising. And so that was its, it's that's its only motivation, really. Uh, but um, yeah, uh, really, really cool people work in the Internet Archive. Yeah. yeah, and it just seems to me to be an alternative library, so. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they archive everything. So, you know, the books is one part of, of this. But I love they, what they do with video. They have a manual for one of my casting machines that I actually don't have a physical copy and I reference the Internet Archive uh, scan of it all the time. Right. And otherwise it might be impossible to find. Oh, you like can't that. find it. It's so hard to find that stuff. Yeah. Wow, that's that's very helpful for you. Wow. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, the manuals for all of the stuff that you have, Mark, is... Oh, oh, yeah. I need all the manuals. Like, they, I need hard copies. Just, I don't know. I feel like I lost a few in the move. A few things didn't get put together. So, yeah, as long as somebody's got a copy, that's all that matters. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I, I'm kind of a book artist, um, a junkie or, or what do you call? Yeah. Somebody who just really follows the book artists now, especially like I, I've always enjoyed those special editions and the pop-up books and the pieces of art. But now I'm just so intrigued by, by all that are available. Yeah. It's crazy. I know, I'd like to have a few more of myself. I, I joke, I actually don't really keep a lot of books around because once I've read something, usually I put it away. But I keep art books and beautiful books. Those are the ones I want to reference, you know. Those yeah. get something else from the library when I need it. Um, but yeah. Yeah, same here. I, I don't keep regular books anymore because I don't, you know, the space it takes and moving. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're just moving to LA. I mean, I have way less than Mark, but I was just like, oh, we have quite a few boxes of books. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have all kinds of stuff. I love collecting things. But, yeah. yeah. Um, so, Mark, I, I wanted to ask, now in your new space, do you have a guitar studio there, too? It's funny, yeah. It's, uh, it's actually right there behind me. <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> two amps are always plugged in. Um, yep, and then I think the, yeah, there's the guitar on the press there. <laughs> nice. I can make lots of noise out here, which is nice. Uh, no one, no one's gonna yell at me for turning it up all the way, so it's really pleasant. That's great because to me that made all the sense in the world. You know, you just do, you know, do a few of your casting things, and then you go blow off some steam with your yeah. guitar, and it just fits so nicely into the film. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's all. It's one of the things. Just I'm very lucky in that I've always had, or for a long time, like a studio just as part of my lifestyle. I have to have a studio to do what I do. And a studio is just a, a wonderful private space to do anything you want. And then, yeah, blasting a guitar without bothering anyone is, is pretty rare to find a space to do that. Absolutely. Well, it's just such motivation to for anybody to embody the book and the story. And it's it, it really does transform a reader's experience. Um, of both the book and the content or text with such works of art, it just makes reading, reading whatever the content is, just such a special experience. So thank you for your work, both of you. Oh, yes. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, it takes a lot of time and effort to put this. <laughs> um, this. This movie does not expect to come together. So, you know. You gotta do something. Yeah, you yeah. Do something. Yeah, we got to take all the time. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you both for taking this time to to help us all deepen the understanding of what goes into book art and how maybe we, some of us, can become collectors ourselves. And I, <laughs> I, I also hope that you're both able to take in some of the other documentaries that we're we're screening. 
during Docklands. And oh yeah, it looks like a good lineup. Um, yeah, looking forward to that. Got all the time to watch things right now, so uh, you know, it'll be good. A good time, yeah. yeah. So thanks, thanks to both of you for, for joining us and all the best with your plans for Codex in May, Mark, I hope. Thank you so much, yeah. Oh yeah, we should we should um, you should plug it. It's the prototype press. It's, it's yes, pr prototype press. Easy to look up. Great. Yeah, you know because you're still selling books. You're still making them. <laughs> so, still selling books. No, there's always a new book. You know, you can't can't have all this stuff without you know a project always on the burner. You know, it'd be a waste otherwise. Yeah. So one of them could be yours. <laughs> so, yeah. Exactly. Anyway. Yeah. Thank you very much. You bet. Uh, Take care. Thanks, thanks Jenny. It's been lovely talking. Yeah, see you soon. See you soon. Have a good afternoon. Bye.